and go ahead and be seated, if you will. So we are going to continue with what we started last week in John chapter 4. Last week we looked at the woman at the well, and uh, it's really quite telling because in the account, uh, Jesus does what is completely out of character for a Hebrew, for a teacher, preacher, prophet, holy man, if you will. And in the process of that, we get to see a lot of insight as we discover Jesus. Because it, it, we come into this, most of us are churchgoers, and a lot of us have been uh, raised in the church, and so we were raised with uh, the fundamentals, if you will, or the foundations of really whatever preacher or whatever denomination you might have been in. Um, I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church, and so my f fundamental belief system is grounded in Scripture, but it's also been influenced by the doctrines and the tenets of the Southern Baptist faith. And there are some that are Lutheran and Methodist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian and so on and so forth. So we, we all come into this with a lot of, of stuff that we know or have been taught or should know or maybe should forget. This morning I want to look at the middle part of this account. Because last week, Jesus went to the well. He was thirsty. He sat by the well. Uh, a woman came in the middle of the afternoon, and Jesus asked her for a drink. Uh, she was a Samaritan woman. Uh, it was very out of character uh, for a Hebrew male to, to look at, much less speak to a Samaritan or a Samaritan woman, especially a Samaritan woman. And it was completely out of culture for a holy person, a priest, a teacher, a rabbi, whomever it was a religious leader, to even acknowledge the existence of a Samaritan woman. And yet Jesus, as he's sitting by the well, the woman comes in, he knows she's a Samaritan, and he says, give me a drink. And then they have a conversation and she tells him what she knows, and he imparts part of what he knows, and he begins to engage this, this woman, this woman who was probably a woman of ill repute. Uh, women didn't come in the middle of the day to draw water. As I mentioned last week, they came in the morning. They usually came in groups, or they came in the evening when it had cooled off some. But if you live in western Colorado, it's not cooling down much by 5 or 6 o'clock. And they're hotter than we are. So this woman was more or less an outcast. And yet Jesus interacts with her when it was not the common practice. Have you ever wondered why? I wonder a lot. But I know the answer to this, and I think you do too. Because he loved her, yes, but he also recognized that she had a need that she didn't even know she needed. She, see, she, she came to the well to get water so that she could go back home and use the water and come back tomorrow afternoon, and that was the practice. And we see that in, in, in the text, that she, what she wants after Jesus begins to tell her about uh, the living water that, that springs up and it basically um, overwhelms you and, and it's the Spirit of God that, that is filling you and is, is meeting your needs and speaking for you. She still wants relief from having to come in the middle of the afternoon to get water by herself. So that's kind of where we left it. Jesus met her right where she was. He broke the social norms. And then he says this in verse 16. Go, call your husband, and come here. So he asks her a very personal, pointed question, if you will. Um, it might not have been uncommon if Jesus were a Samaritan, but he wasn't. He was a, a Hebrew, and he was Jesus. She didn't know he was the Son of God. She would s soon find out. But he said, go, call your husband, and come here. Verse 17 says, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. 
Jesus said to her, You have correctly said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you are now, who you now is not your husband, this you have truly said, or said truly. So he asks her a question. And here's, here's what she does. She answers honestly. Do you know how easy it would be to say, well, you know, I'm not married. Or I'm single. Or, or I, I, it's none of your business. But she says, but I have no husband. And then Jesus does something that is very much in character. He acknowledges her truth. See, Scripture says, know the truth and the truth shall set you free, right? Isn't that scriptural? Go ahead, everybody nod. It's true. That is what the Bible says. So know the truth and the truth will set you free. So, so Jesus asks the question. The woman answers honestly. And all of a sudden, the doors open for this woman. But not just for this woman, as we'll see in the next couple of weeks, for every person that she comes in contact with. See, true worship begins with the object of your worship or the person of your worship. And for the believer, the only person to worship is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we only get to the Father and have the Holy Spirit in within us by Christ Jesus. So our true object of worship is Jesus, is the person of Jesus. So you got to establish, well, who am I going to worship? What am I going to worship? Because we live in a culture, and it's not just our culture. It's probably all the cultures and, and all the generations that ever lived is we have different objects of worship. Some people worship money. Some people worship people. Some people worship tradition. Some people worship um, country and state or city or, or spouse or, or family, the heritage of your family. But Christ has come to, to be the, the focal point of all worship as the only one, not only to worship, but that is worthy of the worship. Because if we worship anyone and anything other, th other than Christ, then there's no benefit in that worship. And so the woman answers correctly. Jesus acknowledges what she would deem as being supernatural information. How did he know that I wasn't married? How did she know that Ramon or whomever that I was shacking up with, how, how did he know? And how did he know I've had five husbands? So this is John's very clearly pointing to the supernatural revelation that Jesus is letting this woman in on, is that I, I know you. I know you. Everyone else thinks they might, but I know exactly who you are. For us, he knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly who Rayleigh Shirley is. He knows all of my blemishes, all of my failures, all of my sin, all of my successes, everything there is to know about me. And so when, when God reaches into you and reaches out to you, he's doing it with the full knowledge that you're not worthy. But he's going to make us worthy. Not because of us, but because of what he's going to do for us and in those who believe. I mean, God is not going to, to allow his Holy Spirit to reside in something that has not been made, made whole by God. So this woman acknowledges the truth. Stranger, who I perceive as a teacher or a rabbi or, or, or someone much, much more knowledgeable than I am, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just going to be open with you. I'm, I'm going to be transparent to you. You know, for the, for the church, 
That needs to be our response. That has to be our, 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 our ultimate desire. It's for God to see us for who we are because he does already. And so this is as much her coming to grips and publicly saying what everybody probably already knows that I'm a sinner, that I live in sin. And then Jesus does this. Uh, let me go back to what the woman said. Uh, the woman in 19 says, um, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. That's not a bad guess. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people, that being the Hebrews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So I don't know, I don't know if you, you get what's going on here. So he said... For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Then the woman said, I think you're a prophet. I perceive you're a prophet. But there can be a but here, okay? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So here's what she's done. She's, she's going, you... You've, you've, you know me, but we worship differently. We believe differently. You go to Jerusalem because that's what you guys believe. We go to Mount Gerizim, the place where Abraham and those that were going into the promised land shouted praises to God before they entered the promised land, and we've chosen Shechem to be the place where, where we worship See, there's a difference between us. You're Jew. I'm Samaritan. You worship in Jerusalem. I worship in Shechem. So there's this, this dissolving, if you will, of internal blockage. Because again, she's being honest. This is what she feels. You're different than I am. You're a Hebrew. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. And we are completely and totally different. You despise us. And because you despise us, we despise you. And so Jesus is going to do what Jesus does. He wants to break down the religious barriers. The, the minutia, if you will of things that we've always held true because he wants her, she wants us to know the truth. That it doesn't matter if you worship at the temple in Jerusalem or you worship at the bottom of Mount Gerizim. It makes no difference. Period. Where you worship makes no difference. Here's what he says next. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither this mountain nor Jerusalem will worship the Father. A time's coming when you have to acknowledge that it doesn't matter. Now, if you're a historian, then you know in A.D. 70, Jerusalem was sacked and the, the temple was sacked and destroyed. So Israel no longer had a place to worship. Because it doesn't matter if it's a building or a creekside or a home. Worshiping God is the command. The place is the privilege. We're blessed to have this building that we can come and, and we can share our lives with, with each other and we can worship God and we can sing and, and we, can, we can cry and we can pray. But without the building, it doesn't change that we're the church. It doesn't change that, that he is worthy of our worship. And yet I fear that some people, if this building were to go away, would, would go away. And that's not what Jesus intends. He goes on in verse 22. He's going to be just a little bit clearer 
on his, what, he, what he's saying and what his intention is. Verse 22 says, you worship what you do not know. We worship, that being the Hebrews, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Any idea why he said that or what that means? Can I tell you? You want to know? Who wants to know? Inquiring minds want to know. The Samaritans only believed in the first five books, or the Pentateuch. That was their Bible. That was their scripture. The Hebrews had all of the revealed word of God, whatever it was, it, it, the Old Testament it would be. And they knew more of the character and the person of God than the Samaritans ever could. And the Isra Israelites were God's chosen people. So he's, he, he's not maligning her. He's saying, you only have some knowledge. The Hebrews have all of the revealed knowledge to date. They know God and they understand God deeper because they know more about him. And he's interacted with them and he's led them and, and he's fed them. So you don't really know but I don't, I know, Jesus might say. And it doesn't matter that you don't know, because I'm here to teach you. I'm here to tell you. Not that you don't know, but I want to tell you what you don't know. I want to fill in the blanks for you. Let me go on. Verse 22 again, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And so salvation is, would be the, the key word there, because that's what Jesus is concerned with, if he's concerned at all. That's, what, that's his intent, is to, to expose her to the gospel, to the good news of who Jesus is. Verse 23 says, but an hour is coming... And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now the word spirit here is not the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit that resides in us because of what God has done. So he's saying, the time has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father. And these are the people that God is seeking. See, the truth about God is this, he, he not only knows us, he not only made us, but he cares about us. Jesus cared about this woman that no one seemed to care about, used and abused and thrown away. Shunned by her community, probably. If not, she would have been part of the group in the morning or the group in the, in the early evening to come and get water. But instead, she's coming by herself. And Jesus, the only Son of God, has a conversation with her. What does that tell you about Jesus? That he cared for this lady. And if he cared for this lady who was not of his culture who was a female and not a male, that he loves you exactly the same. And he loves everyone you know exactly the same. doesn't matter if they're Buddhist, Hindu, Mormon, Wesleyan, whatever it might be. He desires that everyone learn how to truly worship God. And the truth is God's revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. We have his word. See, because we, we could be having that same conversation today with, the, with this woman or with someone who only believed the first five books of, of the Old Testament and say, you don't know, but I know because I have the full written revelation of God. So let me tell you about... And that's, that's not, again, not to malign or disparage anyone else, but this is the complete, full God book. 
We don't add anything to it. We don't subtract it. It's either holy, it's either true, or it's not. By faith, we believe that it is. And in it, we see God. In it, we see ourselves. In it, in it we truly see each other. And what God has done through history, what God is doing currently, and it might not seem like God is doing much currently, but he is, because he's doing it in you, and he's doing it in me. Verse 24 again says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we've got to, we've got to be willing to allow him to continue the transforming process of making us more like Jesus. So we mature and we grow in the knowledge and the understanding of who God is. And that's part of why he left us this book. So that we would be able to open it and, and see John 3.16, For God so loved the world. You know with that one simple verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you, do you see how much of God is in this? And questions that we could ask ourselves just based on this one simple verse. For God so loved the world. Okay, we'll just put a pause there. So God loves the world. So then the question Ray would ask is, well, do I love the world? Do I love the people of the world? Is he talking just about the planet? Or is he talking about the inhabitants of the planet? Is he talking about all creation? Or is he talking... What's he talking about? That he... That, Pause. Okay, now we're going to start again. That he gave his only begotten son, his one, one and only son. Well, how does God have a son? If God is spirit. And we could go on and on and on with those questions. But that's just how, how full God's word is. If we'll read it and pray over it and study it and allow him to teach us his word. And God is spirit, verse 24. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So it's not a can worship in spirit and truth. It's a you got to do it. It's a must. Because we can't do it otherwise. Because then our worship stops being true worship when we start worshiping things and people and stuff that we don't understand that is supplanting God. And then on, we'll carry on to verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting to be free. I'm waiting to be made whole. I know the promise that God said he'd fulfill. And when that happens, everything's going to be perfect. I'll never have to go to the well again. People will like me and love me. So what did Jesus say? I who speak to you am. And we add the he. But it should probably be just am because Jesus made the I am statements. I who speak to you am. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one of God. I am redemption. I am salvation. I am all that the Old Testament pointed to, all that the New Testament points to, and from this point forward, all the rest of the New Testament all, and all the rest of, of eternity, I am. No one else. Nothing else. I'm who you've been waiting for. Now, just we got to pause here and, 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 and take a break. Jesus rarely told anyone he was the Messiah. Partially because there were religious disparities, there were, were political implications, not that he didn't, but he rarely said out loud that he was the Messiah. 
certainly to someone who wasn't in his group. But think, think for, with me for a minute. Why would he do it now? Why would he? I mean, th this is earth-shattering, religion-shattering, uh, societal-shattering, politically-shattering. He's saying, I am the Messiah to a Samaritan woman who nobody loves, everybody hates. They all think she's just a, a harlot. And yet he, being the only son of God, says to this woman, no one else is around. The disciples haven't returned yet. He says, I'm the Messiah. The one who's speaking to you, that's me. I am. It's a, another thought to ponder in our Bible study. Why would Jesus let her in on what has been a secret or has not been revealed eternally? Because he loved this woman, he met her where she was, and he told her what she needed to know to transform her life and give her the opportunity to, to profess him as Lord so that her life would change. But it wasn't just about her. We'll see this next week. It was about, it was about everyone that she knew, cared about, might have loved, might have hated. It was about ushering the Samaritans into the knowledge that Jesus saves so that they could truly worship not the religion of the Samaritans, not the religion of the Jews, but the promised one of all of their religion. Because see, Jesus takes religion and he says, if it doesn't flow through me, it's not worth anything. And yet the Bible says that religion is, is a good thing. So true religion, true worship, true salvation. Jesus said, you can say this with me, I am the way, say it, I am the, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except by or through me, right? So Jesus was imparting to this woman just what he imparted to you when you professed faith in Christ, if you're a believer, is that Jesus is the way to God. He must have known her heart would accept it. I didn't prompt her at all. She, she's just... No, no. Because Jesus knows our heart. He knows our mind. He knows what we think. He knows what we believe. He knows what we feel. And he's going to address Ray differently than he's going to address Devin or Rocky or Lana. He's going to meet us right where we are so that we will respond in a way that brings him glory. Hallelujah! Praise God! Because if not, then, you know, then we might as well go sit and bake in the sun. Because he's either worthy of our worship, worthy of every praise that we sing to him, that we lift up to him, or he's not. And the proof is in us. The changed life. We sang, change my heart, oh God. Man, that's what he does. We know that. But do others, the people you hang out with, know that Jesus saves. That he loves them as much as he loves you. So he was, he was priming the pump, if you will, for that city and those that made up the city and the surrounding communities got a, a hose full of God. Because this woman was going to be the instrument that God used to transform her community. Wow! But God, you know, you only read the, oh, I'm sorry, oh God, I'm so confused. You only use the, the righteous and the holy. God, you'd never use someone like that. You'd never use someone like me. Well, let me just remind you, he spoke through a donkey. 
He used a donkey to meet his purposes. If he can use a donkey, he can use me and he can use you, right? He speaks through the weather. He speaks through storms, through fire. But more often than not, he speaks to you. Almost done. Pause. Play. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Okay? Just a woman. Not a Samaritan woman. They were amazed that he was conversing with a female Yet no one said anything. No one said, what do you seek or why do you speak to her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. So the disciples come and again, you've got to see God's timing. If the disciples would have come 30 seconds earlier, a minute earlier, or, or if, if Jesus would have, would have hindered his conversation, the conversation with Jesus and the woman ended, and then auto, all of a sudden the disciples show up. God is in control of time too. And he, this was perfect for this lady. But this was perfect for the disciples, too, because the disciples are going to learn a lesson as well, because we all need to learn things. And they knew enough about Jesus that they didn't say something stupid. What's she doing here? Don't you know you're not supposed to be talking to her? That would have been normal. But the disciples were calm enough, intuitive enough, spirit-led. It doesn't say that. I don't, I don't know. But, but they didn't do what they normally do. Peter didn't stick his big nose in and say something ridiculous. And so the conversation ended. The woman picked up her water pot after having given Jesus water, I guess, Turned and walked away. And you know what she did? Come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. And then she asked the question, this is not the Christ, is it? This isn't who we've been waiting for, is it? She doesn't beckon them. It ends with this. They went out of the city and were coming to him. So all of a sudden, the people of the town that, that wouldn't acknowledge, wouldn't, wouldn't, it, she was not, nothing and no one to them. She comes in, comes into town, says what she says, and all of a sudden, people head out to Jesus. How is that? How does that happen? Because God is in control. Maybe they saw something in her. Maybe they were, were dr drawn and driven by, by the question of, isn't this the Messiah or this isn't the Messiah, is it? She didn't say, why don't you come see but all of a sudden, that single spark, that single match, if you will, touched the other people. And for some reason, they wanted to go see what this was all about. We're going to stop here today. We've got at least one more week in here. I'd plan this to be a one and done a one and done. Man, but the more I looked, the more I studied, it's like, oh, I can't. I like taking things in context. I think we need to take things in context.
But I'm going to leave you with a contextual pause. Because things are going to change even more. Not just for a woman, but for a whole culture. Because that's what God does. He starts with one person. And that one person tells one person, and so on and so forth and so forth and so forth, until all of a sudden we have a, a, a Christian believing group that know the truth, and the truth has set them free. I pray that that's our, our desire, our want, for the truth of who Christ is, not to just be real in our lives, which we need to pray for and, 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 and make sure that, that we're walking with Him, but the, those people that we know and love, that He would be just as real to them. Because John 3.16 3, is as true as John 14.30. God loves the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this account in scripture. I thank you that you, you laid it upon John's heart, Father, to write these things. I pray, God, that we would see you, see your activity, and Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would transform our minds, that we would strive to be more like Jesus. Father, to be willing to ask the, the hard questions, to admit the hard truths about ourselves and, and, and those things in our life, Father, that might not be what they should be. Father, I pray that you would continue to draw us all to yourself, that we would see light at the end of the tunnel every single day, that we would be people of hope, we would be people of joy, we would be people of purpose, knowing that you are God. And everything flows through you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So why don't we stand? Let's sing. We're going to sing a, All to Thee, I believe, is the song we're going to sing this morning. The words will be on the screen. Pray for each other this week. Have a blessed week.